on and you're in the app right you're not integrated camera uh, my image uh, anything under advanced something in your main settings so right and, and you're on the app right not in the browser yeah i might just do because i um i had a problem with uh, something on this all right so since they're figuring themselves out right now i did stick justin on mute uh just for now um <clears throat> until we can figure out what's happening with this camera uh, and then if anything, if we end up going uh, just to audio for him, we might have to just go to audio for him. So that'll be a bummer, but it's entirely possible that does happen. Uh, so, all right, we've got people joining us and like clockwork, Steve and Martha Hewitt are back from Columbus, Ohio. Uh, so thank you again for joining us. Uh, right now, the wildfire smoke uh, is not clear huh so is is now turning your skies uh dark they're still kind of semi smoky and all here uh actually uh, we had some blue skies yesterday uh but um today it seems like that's uh, turned again on us so no things will get better again um so we've got justin almost joining us again i can see the screen is black I'll give that just a second justin i'm gonna go ahead and stick you on mute as you're troubleshooting all righty so cool and then we got a bunch more people joining us uh, a lot of our normal uh, listeners and followers uh, are back again so thank you so much for joining us and we also have some of our team members on today as we start to see a few more people join us on Facebook um, we'll just Take a second here to hang out and hope that Justin can figure his camera out. We do a practice session, everybody, uh, every, every, before every show, uh, usually a day or two before where we figure out all the tech and lighting and who's sitting where and what, how it's gonna go. And so inevitably something always ends up uh, becoming a hiccup for us uh, on, on something. Um, in this case, it looks like Justin's camera on, a, on the very computer that he was using for our practice session isn't allowing him to uh, be seen. So, I mean, he could always be heard, uh, but not seen this time around. So. Alrighty, well, while Justin is figuring that out, um, we're going to get started. We're about just about five minutes in. So we usually start about five minutes in. So let's do it. Uh, all right. So once again, Chris Toronto with the Paso Robles Wine Country Alliance uh, from PasoWine.com. Thank you so much for joining us for another hangout. Uh, we are hanging out today uh, talking about uh, a little bit of the behind the scenes of how a wine bottle basically finds its way onto a store shelf or a wine list. And what I've done, we have at the Alliance, we have a thing called the Trade Committee. We, we, we bring all of these folks together that work and um, kind of grind it out in, in what's called the three-tier system. And we'll get into that in a little bit. And in trying to make sure that their wines are sold out on the marketplace. So it's not just out the cellar door or not just basically, you know, direct to you. The there you are. Stand. All right. Yoo-hoo. But you do get your phone working or? <laughs> no. You know, I was on a Microsoft uh, meetings, uh, meeting right before this, another app, and I had that window up. So I had to close that. Oh. Sweet. 
There was right. no nerves involved with that at all, was there? Because <laughs> no. we've all been there, right? Like no, that's what the wine's for. <laughs> yeah. You're gonna ship you two bottles. <laughs> yeah. Take a little <laughs> wine and proms go away. I was sweating a little. I was even getting a little shinier than normal. So <laughs> that's great. I was gonna say, let me put my sunglasses on here, guys. Okay? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> So I was just doing the intros, Justin, and actually I'm just going to get to uh, introducing everybody after I talked a little bit about the premise of today's show. Uh, but I want to start uh, just a, a quick little round robin, a 30 second who you are and uh, who you're with and, and, and all of that. Uh, Carrie Thrasher with Opalo. Let's start with you, bud. All right. So I've been with Opalo for 11 years. I've been in the wine business I started trying to add up between restaurants and retail and being with an importer, I think it was something like 24 years total in the wine business and the multi uh, facilities or capacities, I think I should say. And said, been with Opalo for 11 years, uh, seen the company grow from about 40,000 cases to where we are now, which is sub 100,000, but you know, to, you know, COVID didn't help anything that's growing this year by any means, but uh, I think we can all say that. But uh, on the road a lot normally, haven't been on an airplane since March. Did get a green light this week to uh, go do some wine in Reno in October. So that was the first positive that I had in that capacity. And I think my broker on the West Coast is trying to uh, get me something going over there in Florida. Done. All right, cool. Kerry is always on the road. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to him. We'll, and of course, we're going to be sitting around hanging out here for an hour here talking about this subject, but we'll, we'll get to his road travels as well here pretty soon. Steve Lister uh, with Vina Robles. Hello, everybody. I uh, hope everyone's doing well and staying healthy. Uh, I've been in the wine industry since uh, 94. I've been working for um, wineries as a uh, as a regional manager so for 22 years. I'm dating myself here. I used to be a young guy. Now I'm the middle-aged guy. But uh, the wine industry has been great to me. I've met my wife through the, the wine industry. I have three kids who are raised here in Templeton. I manage four uh, salespeople throughout the U.S., one in the Northeast, one in the Midwest, uh, one in um, Florida, and then on the West Coast here. Uh, we're in 38 markets. Uh, two brokers uh, um, and six export markets. Um, again, Vina Robles Winery. Uh, I, we're watching it grow here. I'm four years with uh, Vina Robles and seen some phenomenal growth. Uh, great people, great winemaking team, a great team in general. Uh, and what I do, my job is to grow the, the, the business, um, drive distribution, drive volume, uh, and doing it. it basically through education, firing salespeople, um, and uh, having some fun. So getting the word out there about Vina Robles. Everything we do is 100% of state. And so if you haven't heard of us, uh, you'll see a lot more of us in the years to come. A little bit, a little bit about me, and uh, pass it back, cool. Chris. Right on, thank you. Justin, uh, again, thanks again for being able to make that connection today. Uh, great to have you. You're actually on the road right now, uh, but Justin with uh, Broken Earth Winery. Yeah, so I'm coming from you guys from our Chicago tasting room. That's in the background. And uh, so Broken Earth, um, we, uh, the vineyard started back in 1973. It was Rancho Tierra Rajada. Um, some actors you guys probably know, Columbo, Peter Falk, Wayne Rogers, uh, James Kahn from Godfather. So it was really kind of the first commercial vineyard that was established back in, yeah, 1973. And it's uh, got a lot of history to it. We'll be talking about CV. That's the bottle that I brought along today. Um, but Broken Earth, we have our estate brand. Everybody knows distributed in 45 states. Uh, we also have, I brought with us our pool brand. So this is uh, kind of our entry level value turner. Um, that's at a $16.99 price point. And then we also do a lot of private label. And so uh, our winemaker, Chris Cameron, uh, he's made wine in uh, five different countries. 
Uh, he's brought over a lot of varietals to Paso Robles. Uh, we just planted Nero Diablo. Um, we got Trontes coming online. We're doing some sparkling stuff. So our portfolio is, is probably the size of, you know, treasury. It's huge, even though we're just at about 100,000 cases in distribution. So we do sparkling, we do fortified, we do four different pricing tiers within the, the Broken Earth tier brand. So really my role at, at Broken Earth um, is uh, more of a general manager side, but I spend most of my time on sales and marketing, uh, work in 40 different states, um, work in the private label aspect, which is right now booming, and I'm sure we'll talk about that. Um, the winery uh, is owned and operated by Jerry Forsythe, the Forsythe family uh, here in Chicago. Uh, they also have roots in California throughout the Midwest. Um, and right now the Chicago tasting room is ran by uh, Missy and, and the family. So um, they're the pr proprietors, uh, Chris, the winemaker, myself, the general manager, and then two tasting rooms in the U.S. currently. We're looking to expand that operation. So that's broken earth for you. Thank you very much. Thanks for that introduction. Hey, Justin, I'm going to ask that when you're not talking, if you wouldn't mind uh, clicking mute, uh, there's a little bit of background noise there. So that'll help us out. But you might have, we might remind you to unmute yourself before you start <laughs> talking though each time, because that's inevitable. Right on you guys. Thanks so much for joining us. So again, we're talking about basically the three tier system. How does wine actually get out there in a market? And so for all of you all over the country that are watching today or even locally um, and not in the wine industry, it takes somebody to get that wine out into market. You can make really good wine, but it's not selling itself. Uh, and so there are people that actually specifically do that, especially for when it comes to distribution. Uh, and so these guys, I've asked them very specifically to, to be on my show today because I know I've traveled so much uh, in promoting uh, Paso Robles wines. Uh, and these guys are always on the road, always out there on ride widths, doing dinners, doing all kinds of thing, things that are all about uh, trying to make expand the brand awareness of their specific winery. But these guys are also champions of talking about Paso as well, because believe it or not, Paso over time, I mean, it's just now that we're really starting to find our way uh, into more and more store shelves. We talked about this as a group recently. Carrie, you had something interesting to say about how at some point in time, Paso and getting Paso known that, you know, they would only maybe carry one skew of Paso wine. What's Definitely. it like today? Talk about before and talk about today. Well, I mean, as been doing this long enough that when you would go to a distributor, that's what you have to get before anything. There's very few places that you can just direct sell uh, in to a store. You, there's a lot of places you can ship to these days, and it's opened up a little bit. But to find a distributor, you have to find somebody willing to bring in your brand. And... You could have good wines, you could work the, the labels, you could have ratings, but so many people had a stigma, especially not as much on the West Coast. People know Paso wines on the West Coast. The further East you get, it's like, oh, well, I already have this brand from Paso. They wouldn't think they needed another one. We, I got Paso covered, I've got this brand. And I'm looking at 30 Napa Valley brands in their portfolio. And they wouldn't, they would never stop at one Napa Valley or one Sonoma or one Italian producer, but they would stop that one Paso. And here over the last, probably really since COVID started, I've actually had about four different distributors in different markets come to us. And I check their portfolio when they come to us to, to see what brands are in their portfolio. And they already have two or three Paso brands, but they're still actually seeking us to bring in. So it's starting to change. And that's been somewhat recent that we didn't have that struggle. Yeah. Steve, you've, you've been in the industry a while. You were actually at another brand, a rather iconic brand in Paso that I think helped open the doors for Paso Wines to uh, be recognized. But it's still been an uphill battle out there, right? You know, back in when I early started in 99, uh, working for a supplier, uh, traveling throughout the country, people would say, say things like, it sounds so silly now, but people would say, you know, where, where, how close to Mondavi are you? I mean, I heard that 
I mean, it sounds silly now, right? Because Paso Robles has become such, but it wasn't that long ago. It was, you know, tw- less than 22 years ago where I heard, where, you know, where from Mandavi are you? So uh, I think a lot of people's eyes have been opened. Uh, I've, I've seen over my career, there's been a huge amount of investment. Um, when I first came to Paso Robles, you saw old beat up pickup trucks. You got the dog with the hay bale in the back with the flatbed. We still have that here, but that's followed by the Bentley and the really nice Porsche and uh, uh, really super wealthy cars. So this area has changed dramatically uh, since I came here in uh, the mid nineties. So it's really, it's, it's great to see. Um, and it's also great to see that uh, we're still retaining a part of our culture. You know, my kids don't go to school with, you know, these fancy schmancy. It's still the guys with the flatbed pickup trucks and their dog in the back. So it's really neat to see. How, how is it trying to impart? Because that's so much about our personality that I think helps sell the brand. And really for all three of you, I mean, how hard is it to impart um, upon these people that are selling your wines on behalf of you and then also <clears throat> picking up your wines that the personality of the region, I mean, where, is that, where, where does the challenge lie there? And, and is it a selling point? Yeah, I'll jump in on that one. I mean, I, I think it's interesting what I'm seeing, at least in the market, is you're selling to, I'll call it the gatekeeper, whether it's a grocery store chain or whether it's a, a restaurant. And so they all know Paso. They've been to Paso. They know what Paso is capable of, but they're not buying the wine for themselves. So really what they're looking at is what are their customers buying? And I mean, for the longest time, we all know that's kind of been Napa, you know, Paso has been on this rocket ship as of late, but it's still in my mind, in certain parts of the U S somewhat undiscovered people know about, it and they're like, yeah, I know, you know, like that's central California, kind of what Steve was saying. But I mean, I think that through all of us and PRWCA, like still getting it out there and getting past the gatekeepers, but more to the, the customer is really the challenge and the perception that I see is, you know, that, that Napa is still driving that bus. That's my experience. Let's talk about well, the you, you oh, had go ahead, Carrie. Thing, year, years ago, Chris, when we were doing the Boston Wine Expo, you brought me over a, a laminated map that showed where Paso was on the region. When I go on the central to the east part of the United States, I take that at any event because they don't know where Paso is. West Coast, no problem. Oh, yeah, most of the time. Oh, I know that. Uh, my kids went to Cal Poly. For a small university, you get Cal Poly alums all over the place. Mm-hmm. And, but I always carry that because people, even a few years ago, to, uh, to add to what Steve was talking about, when all the Sonoma fires were happening, I had – a wine director of my Nashville distributor call to see how they were affecting our wines from Sonoma. And I said, we're four hours away from Sonoma and she should know better. You know, she should have known better in her position. (laughs) (laughs) That is definitely, one of those things that is always a challenge for us uh, as far as the wine alliance is, is concerned, but then also in our region in general is, is having uh, these gatekeepers understand where, where we're located and, and really how far we are uh, from some of the more popular or you know, common named uh, wine uh, regions of, of California. Uh, so yeah, that's definitely a challenge. How... Um, What's it, so everybody watching, so, you know, these guys have got to get a distributor on board, right? Yep. A distributor doesn't cover the entire country, right? Distributors cover regions. Some of them only have certain accounts and uh, the ones that they might want or they, they, they're, you know, wanting to, to focus on, whether it be certain types of restaurants or certain chains or whatever it might be, but they're different everywhere. And so there's a lot of kind of components um, to this cell, if you will, uh, to eventually get it on to a store shelf or, or a wine list. And the, the, the challenge for them, of course, is hoping that that end user, that end consumer, you want these wines. And so the, all of the personalities in between, this is still a hand sell business. This is still one of those things that it's a, it's a consistent relationship. And these guys, um, Steve, you were, you were talking a little bit about that uh, yesterday, and I'd love to hear a little bit more. 
Which about one? Relationship. About which? The relationship building part. Oh, absolutely. Relationships are so important. Um, there's there's over 3,000 wineries in California. I think there's 3,600. There's probably more now than I did the research probably two hours ago. <laughs> um, but the challenging part is there's so much competition out there. And we saw a trend um, several years ago where maybe five, 10 years ago, the corporate corporations really got into the wine business. A lot of these wineries that were started in the 70s, 60s in some cases, well, their, their founders are getting to retirement age. So they're ready to sell it off to uh, various larger corporations. A lot of these corporations have one, they have sales reps. They can afford their sales reps to be in various markets. I've got four plus me. So there's just five of us. So we have to build those relationships. And what I always talk about uh, is building a, a, building a fire. You build a fire, say in Southern California, you come back. You can't be in all these places all the time. You go to Southern California, you do a wine dinner, you do a meeting with the sales uh, managers and, and uh, sales people. And then you back off and see if that fire keeps going. If not, you go back to that market and spend some time there. And hopefully then you can go back and maybe travel to Arizona or Texas or, and really build the business like that. Um, there's just so much competition. And uh, to Carrie's point, the farther east you go, much more European wines. I mean, I don't yes. know the, the percentage, but let's say I'm guessing about 50-50. You see the European and Italian. Sometimes it's, it's not even that. I've been in, I've seen wine lists that it was 70% imports to 30% California, and that's all of California. Yeah, and the price points are so aggressive there from, you know, from Spain or even, or even uh, South America, but Italy and France. So it's a whole different environment when you're over there on the, on the West Coast and, and somewhat to the South in Texas and those markets are becoming more and more, if not always have been more and more domestic. Uh, drinkers. But building that relationship with those key gatekeepers, I thought I was the only one that used that term, so I'm, I'm glad to hear other people use it. Those gatekeepers are, are huge. If it's the sales rep that's been doing the uh, sales for 20, 30 years, it's got, you know, fingers in all the, 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 the key accounts, like getting them on board and knowing how to sell your wine and getting excited about it, and actually maybe having them come physically come out to see your property. It just is, is a game changer in a big way. Yeah, that's huge, uh, especially getting them come, to come out and to understand uh, Paso Robles a little bit more. Uh, is, is, that's a program that we do. We call it Paso Wine School. And uh, we, we bring out of 20, 30 uh, uh, these gatekeepers uh, every year to come and experience Paso. Uh, and hopefully uh, go back and be a little bit more open uh, to when uh, you guys uh, come and knock on their door. You know, it might not be the specific brands that they visited with, uh, but it, it, it is hopefully opening their eyes to where we are, who we are, and the personality of the region. Uh, and I want to add what on to Steve. So, I mean, I think when you take, I categorize like the major markets and I look at, say, like New York, Florida, Texas, Illinois, and, and California. And when you go into these markets and you're dealing with a top tier distributor, you really have to understand what strategy that you're going for. Like we're saying, you can't be everywhere. So um, I kind of the age old saying is you build brands on premise. But so we're with Breakthrough in Chicago, they have over a 1000 sales reps here. And well, that's pre COVID. I, I don't know what they're at now. But I mean, you can't get in front of all those guys and educate them and get a brand ambassador. But if you get, say, 15 of them and they always have a bottle of, of your wine in their bag and they know your story and they believe in Paso, then you got something. But you have to really, you know, once you get the distributor, the, real, the work really starts right there. And then you have to really define your strategy and what your brand stands for in the marketplace. So yeah, you have to help the distributors with pull through. And like you said, some part of our job is building relationships with the the you know the salespeople themselves. When you're when you're going on a ride along or or work with that has been non existent since March, but you're trying that time, that windshield time is not not a waste of time by any means. Uh, it is building that relationship with the, some key salespeople. So when there's a cab 
placement that's available at a restaurant or a Zen placement, you're one of them because they, like you said, we're with Breakthrough as well in that market. You want to be one of those because you've won that sales rep over. I want to make this placement for Carrie. Yeah. Uh, and real quick for everybody, so windshield time, that means that they're sitting in a car with a sales rep going from account to account, and that's time in the car that you can spend talking, building that relationship, talking more. And not doing this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I turn my phone off. My office drives my office crazy because they can't get a hold of me. I tell them, hey, I'm with the sales rep today. Not only is it best for our business for me to get to know this person, but I, from a personal standpoint, I've... I've met lifelong friends to this day, <laughs> their children grow up and because I wasn't on my phone texting, I'm actually listening to a, their son got, went to the major league baseball, played for Seattle Mariners and got to see him grow up. And uh, it's, that's probably the best part of this business, getting to know people and telling stories and talking about wine, right? We're in such a great business. It is a lot of work, but uh it's, uh, it's enjoyable as well from, from time to time. There are, I got a short a story to share with you guys, so we'll get there too in a minute. So like Justin. Yeah, I mean, I've made some of the best friends on the road with some of my sales reps. I mean, I consider them friends when I've been, been doing ride-alongs with them for 11 years, you know? Yeah. Uh, I get invited to weddings. You know, they get married and things like that. And I think that's one of the cool parts about this is that we're going into – whether it's Chicago, Southern Illinois, whether it's Austin, you're going, you're in a, in a car with these guys for eight hours, maybe 10 hours, and you're seeing all the parts of that inner city. And I mean, you get exposed to the U S and to relationships and demographics. Like I don't know any other business out there. And that's the part that I really appreciate. You also have to understand that. I mean, you can't go into call it Wayne, Nebraska with a $20 bottle of wine. So, Understanding that demographic and that relationship is it's pretty key. Question that we had come in from Facebook was, uh, do we lead with value or quality or, or both when you guys are out on the market? I think quality. I go in quality. I don't, I don't necessarily, I won't say the price point um, out, out of the gate. Uh, our wines at Vino Robles, um, are affordable. I think most people in and out there in the industry consider Paso Robles a, a very good value, uh, which it is. Um, but uh, when I'm pouring, you know, our, you know, Arborist, uh, this is the Arborist label. I think everyone can see it. Uh, I, I pour it and say, wow, you know, that's good. What's it retail for? About 25? And, and I say, well, no, it's actually about, uh, it could be on your shelf about $18. And whoa, really? That's a, that's a great value. So I always lead with quality. I'm not sure what uh, Carrie and uh, Justin do, but that's, that's my shtick. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to guess everybody, it. oftentimes when we talk about Paso, we're often saying that the quality to value ratio is, is, is incredibly high. And, and, and that is typically something that we have heard as feedback from a lot of the trade uh, out in the market. Uh, I put this slide up so you can, you guys, everyone watching can see what we're uh, sipping on. Um, hey, Steve, you know, you started talking a little bit about the Arborist. Why don't you sell us on this Arborist a little bit? Yeah, so it was, uh, I joined the Vino Robles team about four years ago, and our, our, our owner, our managing partner, Hans, took me out to all of the original, all of our six vineyards. So Vino Robles translates to Vineyard of the Oaks. Our name of our town is El Paso de Robles, the Pass of the Oaks. So we took Vino Robles, um, and so he takes me out to all of the vineyards, and then we went to the where the Sauvignon Blanc vineyard is, is uh, grown, and uh, it's the, the name of that vineyard is Jardine Vineyard. But um, and um, let's see here, make sure I don't forget anything. So Hans takes me out, and we walk through the Sauvignon Blanc vineyard. He points up at the uh, the tree, and he, he kind of a little under his breath says, that, "That's the most expensive tree that we own," and I. And I said, well, why? He said, well, as you can see, it got a little diseased a few years ago and I had to bring in, we had to bring an arborist out to get it healthy again. I said, well, I've been here for about three weeks and I haven't seen her on the website or anything. How come we're not telling people this story? And he 
He says, well, we don't, we don't just, we don't talk about that. You know, it's just something that we kept a tree alive. And so two years later, we, the name just kind of rang through, rang through, and it, we released the first arborist uh, last year of 2017 vintage. And it's just been a phenomenal, uh, received extremely well. And since then, we just kicked off uh, a, a partnership between One Tree Planted, which is a killer nonprofit organization that plants trees throughout the United States, actually throughout the world, but mainly in the United States. And so from proceeds uh, from the arborist, we are committed to planting 15,000 trees a year. Um, and we're working with retailers, uh, restaurateurs, distributors. I just talked to my Colorado broker this morning, Platinum Beverage, and he called me and he said, you know what? I am so inspired by this thing. I'm going to, myself, he's a small guy, uh, he it's um, he's going to plant uh, 500 trees just by himself. He's going to work with our distributor RNDC to plant another to match his 500. So it's just cool. Like, I got to get goosebumps just talking about it. This, this thing that came out of an idea is now coming to fruition. And for us to, I think we all need something to feel good about these days. Uh, and so if we can buy a bottle of wine or help plant a tree throughout the U.S., it's it's pretty darn cool. Um, the blend. Let me just uh, going along here in a long story, but. 41% Syrah, 35 uh, Petite Syrah, 12 Grenache, and 12% Tanat. It sells for between $15 and $18 a bottle. Um, pairs well with, with it's medium bodied, pairs well with like pizza, pasta. I've got little kids at home, so chicken strips from time to time. It's better with the barbecue sauce, which is a ranch, but you know, I've been known to pony up to, uh, to a chicken strip now and again. <laughs> Uh, don't we all know that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right on. Thank you very much, Steve. That's awesome. Um, I'd like to actually, let's continue on our line and we can pick up the discussion more um, ahead. But I, I was debating on which wine I, I was thinking about going with versus uh, the Cabernet Sauvignon or Zinfandel. I actually think we should go Cab before Zin. Uh, I think, Carrie, you were even uh, thinking that one too. Justin, do you want to talk a little bit about this next wine? Yeah, so what I brought today was the, the CB Cab Reserve, and CB stands for Continental Vineyard. So I kind of touched on it a, a little bit, the, the story of the, the vineyard. Um, Herman Schwartz was really the, the captain in bringing all these actors together to plant 500 acres back in 1973. So Rancho Tierra Rajada was the name of the vineyard, has a lot of history, even before it was a vineyard. Um, it was an uh, important part of Paso Robles, east side Paso, uh, a part of a big ranch and um, back when the days when uh, the, the train was coming through Paso, that was a, a land that was fought over and, and really Western settlers, I mean, it was battled over. So it has a lot of spirit um, and we kind of use that as one of our messaging that that spirit lives in each bottle of broken earth. But CV is really the future. So the future when uh, the Forsyth family bought this is we, uh, we changed the name of the vineyard to Continental Vineyard. So really it's a bridge from the past and uh, paying homage and, um, to the tradition and the legacy, but CV is the future. And so uh, Jerry, the owner, um, Every single vintage, he wants the best graded fruit, uh, the best winemaking protocols. This is really what we feel like is the best cap that uh, CB Continental Vineyards can produce. Um, so uh, this is the 2016 Cab Reserve. Uh, we retail this with select uh, accounts. Um, and then also out of our tasting room, the, the retail price on this is $80. Yeah. Delicious wine. Uh, really great ex, uh, expression of, uh, of Cabernet Sauvignon too, by the way. I mean, truly. And everybody, I, I, I stuck it on there on, on the screen for just a hot second, but um, it's uh, from the Estrella basically district of, of Paso. Uh, kind of almost a, a far east uh, area of, of the Paso Robles uh, region. Uh, and historic indeed, uh, because the, the vineyard itself and the original person that, 
that um, established it and everything was part of the establishment of our American viticultural area back in 1983. And so uh, this is definitely a historic uh, vineyard that's been a, a part of our AVA for so long. So cool, thanks for sharing that one. That's absolutely delicious, so really cool. Let, let's talk, let's tell a quick story about so another one of the terms that I, I mean, two terms, one bag, uh, Justin said, you know, you walk in with your bag, blah, blah, blah. These guys actually travel with these really specific uh, wine bags. They're like on rollers and they're all tricked out with where you put your wines and your stuff and your, uh, and they, they can, they're actually, uh, I think uh, Steve or even Carrie might be getting their bags. Yep, there <laughs> it is. So they walk in with one of these guys, uh, you know, you got to make appointments with the tasters. They only taste on Tuesdays at between like, you know, two and two fifteen. <laughs> There's the Opalo bag. <laughs> These guys are a brand new one because my original one from eleven years ago is given out on me. <laughs> eleven I years on the streets week. of the cities. <laughs> it, came, it came with the wine. <laughs> right on. Uh, and so they call it the bag. Uh, the other thing that they they the term that they were using is a ride with, uh, and that's of course that's that windshield time. But these are are very. I mean, th this is part of the business. Um, and I know all of you've got a, a ride with story that you are going to share. We also have some questions out there. We will get to those in just a second, and then we'll eventually get to uh, the Opalo wine. So, but who wants to go first on, on one of these ride with stories? I'll jump in on this one. <laughs> so <clears throat> I, I'll, I'll tell you the, I won't tell you the distributor, but I'll tell you the state, Texas, because you throw Texas in any story and it makes it fantastic. So. <laughs> This guy had been, I mean, probably from the day wine was made, he had been in the industry for 30, 40 years. And so he takes one look at me. And now what I realize is he sized me up and like, this guy's green. He has no idea what he's doing. And so he throws me the keys and he says, all right, Thule, you're, uh, you're taking me around today. I think it'll help, you know, get, get a better feel for the city. And I mean, as you know, uh, usually it's the distributor that drives, sometimes you drive, but you never drive the distributor's car. So we're going along and I mean, it's, it's probably about noontime. Uh, he says, let's go stop at this, this uh, restaurant. We take a two hour lunch. Mind you, this is my first ride along. So, you know, this is all new to me. I don't, I don't know the difference. And then after the lunch, he starts sleeping in his front seat and he hands me over the schedule as to where we're going after that. And at some point I'm just going in and this guy's sleeping in his car for the next hour. So we wrap up the day and you know that we shake hands, good, good, great, wonderful. Well, the next day I go with a rep that actually, you know, is doing their job. And I'm like, hey, I'll, I'll drive your car. And she's like, no, you're not. What the hell is the matter with you? <laughs> And then, so we get to lunchtime and I'm like, yeah, you know, are we going to, let's go take a nice, you know, two hour lunch. And she said, no, we got to see 15 accounts. So not only, you know, do I look like a, a jack wagon in front of the first guy, but now the second person thinks I'm a lunatic uh, <laughs> because I, you know, I learned, learned in the hard way. I went the, yeah. the non-distributor route. <laughs> oh, that's funny. oh man, the rookie story. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Lister. Well, I had a good one. I have a, I've got, I've got a lot over 22 years. You've got quite a few, but, um, so we go, I'm in, I'm in Taos, New Mexico and middle of nowhere, like not like near the village of ski village. Just, I don't even know where I was. So we go into this account and the sales rep that I'm with says to the other sales rep for a different distributor, he says, Hey, why are you snaking me? And, like, she looks at him and says, what are you talking about? He goes, last account we went into, you were ahead of me. You know, 11 o'clock is my time with this buyer. And she's like, no, it's, this is a cattle call. It's first come, first serve, you know? And the buyer was out looking for something or checking inventory. So she comes back and they, those two get into it. Another supplier, he starts getting into it. And I say, hey, buddy, I don't want to get the ball. You know, let them you know, hash it out. So they're, they're, kind of bickering back and forth and the buyer comes back and she says no it, we've never had appointments so the other supplier and the other distributor they leave and we're sitting there my sales up is just sitting there you can just tell he's stewing over it <laughs> he was so angry and he goes i've been coming and calling you for four years 
at 11 o'clock every Tuesday. You're telling me I don't have an appointment, standing appointment? She's like, no. Sitting there, I'm getting the wines out, putting them, you know, you line them up and everything, getting ready to pour. And he goes, ah, screw it. I'm out of here. And he walks out, <laughs> starts his car, right? So I'm like, what do I do? So here's the, here's the buyer. She's like, okay, I'm ready to taste your wine. And I go, I go, well, he's my ride. And I don't know where the heck I am right now. So I got to go. <laughs> so she's like, all right, I saw, I'll send you some samples. You can taste the wines at a later date. So I go get in the car and, and we, we take off. The weirdest thing about the entire situation, he never mentioned it once. It's like it never happened. Like he didn't say like, hey, sorry, man. I know it was awkward in there, but she's kind of a persnickety buyer. <laughs> Nothing. Just it never happened. To this day, it's like the funniest work with I've ever had in my entire life. Did you get, I've had some pretty good ones. Did you get the sale, Steve, or the wines in there? I don't think so, because I don't think he burned his bridge by leaving. I mean, to a buyer, you say, screw it, I'm out of here. You're know, like, what? So that's my, uh, that's my awkward moment. I like awkward moments, but not what they're like on me. I'm getting pranked, you know? <laughs> hey, Carrie, we're going to go to you, and then we're going to go into your wine. All right, so I had several that I was going to go back and forth with, but I had one that started was the longest ride along ever because it lasted for three days. So I'm going to Tulsa, Ooh. Oklahoma to ride along with uh, the sales reps there. And I, I get to the San Diego airport and my flight's delayed. Well, come to find out from my distributor, that my sales rep that I'm supposed to work with is actually coming back from San Diego too. So we end up next to each other on the plane. So we drove from there to Denver, to Denver to, uh, to Tulsa. And then I had, she's picking me up on Monday and picked me up again on Tuesday. And we got to know each other so well. <laughs> but the very first time she gets in the car, she turns and looks at me. She, almost, she puts her hand actually on my knee. She says, what is the best ride along you've ever had? I said, first account, we sold 1,100 cases and we golfed the rest of the day. And she goes, okay, what's the second best ride along you've ever had? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, guys, uh, let's let Carrie. Let's go into uh, the Opalo Zin uh, and and uh, talk a little bit about this. But it's not just any Opalo Zin. What you've provided us is something from the Reserve Collection. So, love to hear a little bit about that. Yeah. So, I went to the winemakers last week, and I said, you know, hey, what do you think is tasting the best right now? And open to anything. I mean, one of the suggestions was the rosé, you know, or Grenache-based rosé. It's like, all right. Either way, I was going to have to have something uh, sent to me. But the winemakers came back and said, we think that this uh, uh, Willow Creek Zinfandel is tasting the best. Just got 91 points. Uh, it'd be great. Well, they failed to actually let me know that it was, they only made 120 cases of it. So it is a very small production. It's uh, made up of 76% uh, Quinn West, which is our original vineyard there on the west side, 14% uh, uh, Dove Pond, 7 Crowed, and 3% Windy Hill. So all Willow Creek Appalachian vineyards, uh, small production. It's not even released yet. When it is released, it's going to be wine club only. Uh, but what I'm going to highlight is it's, our flagship wine, and we're not going to pour it or taste it, which is Mountain Zen. So these four vineyards also go into this with four others, with also some Adelaide fruit in there and some Templeton Gap fruit, I believe. So um, this is what you can find around. This is just that special one that we brought out for today. So uh, the, the wine is 80% French oak, 20% American oak. The American oak is all actually... Uh, uh, Minnesota oak, a little tighter. Uh, the winemaker likes to use it. It's 25% new, five, uh, actually 25% new French and 5% new 
American. And it's really, Zinfandel, I know, used to be what Paso was all about, and we've had a lot of changes, but at Opelo, that's still our leader. Uh, we now have more Cabernet in bottle than we've ever had before, but it even, doesn't even come close to what we have in Zinfandel. And that's what the people that love Opelo, they, that's what they expect from us. So great wine. I said 91 points of wine enthusiasts just last week. And we didn't even start putting wines in for ratings until like three years ago. I finally convinced them to let us start getting ratings. Rick and Dave, the owners, they just didn't want to get into that. They wanted to just keep wowing people with the quality of their wines and not worrying about what other people are going to tell you your wine tastes like. So we've done pretty well since. Right on. What do you guys think? Nice wine. Really nice. Thank you. Trying to get that. Well, you mean, I one of the, the rare people that gets hundred one of 120 cases. <laughs> so I, I can't believe that's a 2018. I can't wait to try that in five years. That's that's fantastic wine. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, that's delicious. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that one. That is that is a really good Zinfandel, and uh, definitely look out for uh, this one when it goes out in the market. Man, um, hey, we have a question, uh, and this is a, this is an interesting one. I'm going to read this one as is too uh, from our chat. Oh, Paul Maynard uh, chimes in and asks. Costco in Los Angeles usually has uh, Opolo and Justin and Tobin James available. Doesn't recall any other Paso labels. Uh, would love to see more. Uh, basically, what are their buying policies like? Are they centralized uh, at all? And, and I think this goes into a bigger question as to how does that work for everybody out there when it comes to Costco? Is it that they're only gonna buy those specific labels for maybe regionally, the Costco say in the greater LA area, or uh, are they buying for all of Costco West Coast? Are they buying all of Costco? I mean, let, you know, let's let's shed some- in, in California, there's three Costco regions. And I, you guys all know this. Uh, you have a buyer that's based in San Diego that also buys for Las Vegas and Colorado and Arizona and Western New Mexico. You have the LA buyer that also buys for Hawaii. And then you have a Northern California buyer that buys for the Bay Area. And I think that's it. Reno. Recall. Reno. And uh, same as Whole Foods. They, they cover over there into Nevada. Yeah. And so we've been lucky enough with our lower tier Zinfandel at Summit Creek to really done well over there in the last probably 12 years. Um, some of the markets we've been in, uh, it didn't stick. Other ones have been sticking for a, a long period of time. And it, you know, we count our blessings for that. Uh, we, we would love to, to do more, but we only have a handful of wines that we can support Costco. I mean, even though we make a, a decent amount of wines, a lot of them, we have over 40, 50 SKUs. A lot of them, we don't ever, we won't make enough ever to be able to support, you know, a volume like Costco. Luckily, we've been able to get that one in there and, you know, up the road, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Nice. It, always, it always used to be Costco's magic formula is if you got a 90 point wine, 90 plus points, and you got over a thousand cases, you're in. I mean, the, the, business model Costco works off of is they take 14% margin. They won't take anything less. They won't take anything more. Um, but I don't know, Steve and Carrie, if you're seeing this, but I've been pitching 90 point wines, 3,000, 4,000 cases. And what Costco's seen, especially in, in California, is these wines that they've never had access to. Um, obviously, COVID is, is shutting down on-premise, tasting rooms, so it's become incredibly competitive, especially in California. I think other parts of the nation, you know, they, they stick to like a cab shard core bridles, but California has been tough to, to break into as of late. Uh, I don't know if you wanted to comment on that at all, Steve. Yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. Um, there's a lot of choices out there. Like I said earlier, 3,600 wineries in California. Uh, Justin, Julie's point. I watched another seminar and a, a speaker from Costco was on, on it. He said, we're seeing more offers of things that we've never been offered before. And um, so it's just, uh, it's kind of hit or miss. And 
to Justin's point again, 90, 90 points uh, helps as well. Get the, get the lines in there. Yeah. And they do rotate. They rotate some things in and out. Uh, I'll see you here in San Luis Obispo. I'll see if they'll put a line in there and it'll be gone. And just like Costco's design, you buy it now or it may not be here when you get back. So. Well, they did a, they actually came, the buyers, uh, regional buyers from Costco came last year uh, to uh, Paso and uh, they just went with the main distributors around the, uh, the state and asked them, who are your Paso brands? And we got invitations. And out of that, they they did a program that promoted Paso. So there was some labels that, from Paso that got picked up there that had never been in there. And not just put in the box, they put, you know, palletized them. And it was, they it lasted for probably a good six months. And then, you know, they the ones that have done the best ended up going back to the wood boxes and things like that. And, so there should be a few extra in there from that program. I, I haven't been in the Costco. The line outside to get into a Costco is so long that I was like, yeah, no. What they should have done, they should have taken the toilet paper section and filled it with wine. I mean, there right? you go, because there was no toilet paper in there. You just got to fill the space. <laughs> a little help. Uh, we got another question from Steve Hewitt over in, in Columbus, Ohio, and I'm going to kind of modify this one a little bit. Uh, but he works at a small bottle shop there uh, in, in uh, Columbus. And one of his frustrations, I guess, uh, if I'm paraphrasing this correctly, uh, is availability and trying to actually get more, carry more Paso wines. So I'm going to modify his question to say, how can, say, a small bottle shop or any bottle shop for that matter, uh, work on getting the distributors that they work with to carry more Paso wine? Is there a, there's probably not a silver bullet, but there's probably something that they can do. Anybody want to chime in on that one? I think uh, Carrie mentioned this early on in, in the call, or maybe we were talking when we did our, uh, our prep for this call, but one of the hardest things, if not the hardest thing in the wine industry these days is getting a distributor to add you to their portfolio. They have, there's so much that they're already tasked with selling. They're getting rid of SKUs instead of bringing things on. So that's been a, it's been a challenge for us is finding a good partner uh, that's big enough that covers the entire market uh, to bring you on and to represent your wines. The big guys, they're so full that they don't necessarily want to introduce new brands. They've already got goals on their Boca style, their other brands from Napa, Sonoma, California. Um, so that's uh, that's been challenging to, to have our wines uh, added to their portfolios. But if, if it will help if a retailer, you if you're a retailer, contact a distributor and say, we can't buy these wines and that is helpful as well. So kind of this push and push pull or pull push. Now, and, and just for the edification of everybody watching, uh, a retailer doesn't necessarily have to only work with one distributor. They can work with multiple distributors, but there are challenges with that as well, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, we're, I mean, we're all looking for the, the same type of thing. I think everybody on this is we're trying to, we want to be with a distributor that's not humongous and just loses us, but we still need them to be able to cover the whole state. Sometimes you can have different distributors in states. Other times, I mean, every state's liquor laws is wrong. And you also have franchise states that once you're in there, you have to fight like hell to ever get out of there. If Gosh, the distributor man. decides to, to uh, not do their job and they don't have to, you're there, you sign a contract, you're with them forever. You may have to have a state seven years to get back in. So all of us are looking for the for the same time. And I'm amazed when we find a good medium-sized distributor. I'm usually in there with about the hand, same handful of brands because we're all looking for that same thing. Yeah, I mean, I was just at a Sunset Food. It's a 10 to 15 unit uh, uh, grocery store chain out here. And the person in front of me said, do you guys carry Niner wine? And I popped up and I said, that's awesome. And I think, you know, to, to the question is, if a retailer or a chain wants to bring it in, the distributor will bring it in. So it, that could help all of us. But I mean, I, I don't know. I, I think it's somewhat of a, a, you know, unfair game in the sense that there's 
the major commercial wineries that drive over 50% of the volume and a sales rep, their bonus based on how well, how quickly they sell, how much profitability. And I'll, I'll take Sutter Home. If Sutter Home's an easy sell, I mean, they're going to sell that. So, you know, I, I think that getting into a distributor, it's so compacted and the market is smaller than everybody thinks. I mean, it's, it's really controlled the top half by the major commercial wineries. So a fantastic smaller winery, it's, it's tough to get in. Um, but I mean, there's always, always ways to do it. Yeah. And those, those major uh, uh, suppliers, if you will, or wineries just out there, I mean, they, they basically fill the shelves. And, and to give a few examples, I mean, just, just think about those namesake brands that you see typically on the shelves. Those, that's what uh, these guys are talking about. And so even though uh, production might be at a, say, 100,000 case level for, for some of these guys, that's still not major. Uh, out there that's still they're still a small uh, brand when it comes to uh, playing on a national scale um, and then it's also important to note that there are some states that are direct ship states that you that that California has a relationship with uh, that they say brands could say ship their wines directly into retailers those are shrinking still um, but ultimately they do actually have to work with a distributor. And so there's a push and pull when it comes to demand versus supply, of course, that exists out there and trying to get wines in the market where not only does it take these guys to get out there, but it also takes some sort of demand to say, Hey, we want more. Um, and, and, but there's really no magic bullet magic key. Uh, to making that happen as much as you, the consumer might ask your bottle shop, Hey, can't you carry, you know, these guys' wines? And then that uh, 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 bottle shop can turn around and look around for distributors. But if, if distribution in the state or in the region isn't carrying those wines, um, then their books could be full and they're not going to necessarily consider it unless an opening and as Carrie was saying once you're in you're in right uh, so I just wanted to clarify that uh, well there's been a, a all the guys here know the consolidation of this business at the distributor level has not been a positive thing for us you know it has not been you could have had a nice relationship with one of these top guys they just merged with one of the other big companies in the state and now they went from having 500,000 SKUs to 100,000 SKUs, or I mean, I'm sorry, to a million SKUs that didn't do it. So, you know, what I'm saying is then you get pushed down because when you talked about a Sutter Home or a, or a Gallo, they get a lot of pressure because of the volume there. They get a lot, a lot of pressure. The sales team, the management, you have to take care of these brands first and we get pushed back. And so, I mean, we have to go in there and try to help the we said the push through it, it is that's what we do whether it's doing sales calls ourselves whether it's doing the ride-alongs wine dinners public tastings incentives the first time i uh suggested incentives for the owners of oplo they were like we're gonna pay someone to sell our wine I'm like yes we want attention you know we we need attention because they're not going to run uh, 50 different uh incentives at the same time but for a brief amount of time you want to try to be that, that wine that gets put in the bag, you know, the, the bag of a sales rep. And if it takes throwing some incentive out there, then, then you do it. It was successful. Thank God it was successful the very first time. And so we're allowed to do them, you know, within reason. Yeah. Thank you. We're getting near our final thoughts here. And I actually, I want to give you guys an opportunity for final thoughts before we talk about what's next for you. And, and so, uh, Justin, you got something to share for us. Sorry, the mute button was fighting me again. So, <laughs> I mean, I, I think all of us, you know, and the point of the show is, is Paso and we all believe in it. I grew up on the central coast. Um, I watched it transform from a billboard that said darn near paradise. Welcome to Paso to I'm in this beautiful wine region with amazing wineries, amazing restaurants. And I think right now with everything going on in California, what I see Paso is, and we see Paso strong is that if, if you're planning a trip to Paso, 
now's the time to do it because, um, you know, Paso's friendly. We, we are uh, working under safety precautions and, and, and all that, but this is what Paso is known for is you can sit down with the owner, with the winemaker. Um, you can do an intimate tasting right now. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll shoot for Broken Earth is that we just released uh, a new sparkling uh, selection. We're releasing uh, Nero Diablo, where we got Trontes, some other wines. Uh, but come out to Paso. This is the perfect time to do it. Um, it's, it's not as busy as it normally is, but uh, yeah, come out to Paso and give it a shot. Cool. Thank you. Lister. You know, I, uh, as I left my house to come to the winery, uh, I've been working from home the past uh, several months, as most of us are. I forgot the wines to taste. I had Arborist here, of course, but so I had to run into town and I ran back home and then come back. And as I was leaving, my wife said, have fun. And I'm stressed out because I'm racing to get back here and everything. And I said, have fun. Like, just like that. And I went, wait, this is fun. Yes. I to talk to my three amigos here and talk to all of you folks. I wish I could see you all, but uh, this was a lot of fun. I appreciate you inviting me, Chris, and the rest of the DRWCA crew. And just uh, be well, everybody. Be safe and be healthy. And uh, we hope to see you soon in Paso Robles. Right on. Thanks. Hey, Kerry, uh, any final thoughts on, on the topic or anything else? Um, you know, we, when you alluded about uh, uh, being at Paso, I grew up in the Central Valley. So Paso was a town you took a left at to go to the beaches. You know, <laughs> that's, that's how I grew up knowing Paso. Oh, that's where we turned left. Huh? Uh, and obviously it's grown the business has been great. I've been around it even before uh, I came to work for Opolo. And, you know, there's our jobs, we're, we're in sales. There's stressful times. There's, there's times that you're asked the impossible. And sometimes you still deliver that impossible. Uh, but there's also good parts of it. I think we talked about it in the pre-meeting a couple days ago. There's that time that you're drinking a great glass of wine and having a great meal. And you realize that's your job. You are you are doing your job as you're promoting your wine, and that makes this part of sales better than selling other things. Absolutely, yeah. Well said. It's not exactly the most glamorous of jobs, as as maybe sometimes people think, but we do actually have fun, and that's uh, important important in life to enjoy what you do, right? So. Guys, does anybody have anything coming up that you want to be able to say? Do you have a virtual tasting? Do you have, is there, is there something you want to be able to say that this is happening? Uh, look us up, website, all of that. Justin, start with you. Yeah, so um, we do, um, like I said, we just introduced our, our sparkling line. And so we have that sparkling dedicated menu. Um, we're doing a, Tim, our taste room manager is going to be doing a, masquerade ball which uh, i thought was pretty clever um that's coming up uh all our events are on our website www.brokenearth.com um so yeah come check us out we got a nice big tent in our front parking lot uh i i'm in chicago right now it's a beautiful 76 degrees i think it's still may, may be pretty hot out there in paso but uh yeah come stop by broken earth right on Lister, you got something happening online? Well, we always got stuff going on online. We're open for tasting. We have a great restaurant, a killer chef. Um, our amphitheater this season is closed, unfortunately. I think what we all in the community are feeling it. Yeah. Uh, but when you can come back in the 2020, 2021 season, we look forward to reopening and getting these uh, star-studded acts. We've got iconic shows here. And I'll leave you with this. I was in Texas. Houston, Texas, and I was telling the, the, the guy at Specs, the, the wine buyer at Specs, and I said, yeah, we've had some great shows. We've had Revivalists. We've had, uh, you know, Willie Nelson. We've had Dolly Parton. And I said, yeah, yeah, you may or may not be a fan of Dolly Parton, but, and he goes, man, if you're not a fan of Dolly Parton, you're lying. <laughs> and I always forget that. It's beautiful. So with that, take care, everybody. Right on. Um, right on. All right. Carrie. Oh, uh, you know, it's been 
very unfortunate this year to have to get rid of all the our festivals and so many of the events that that people count on. You know, those are some of the only weekends I I'm for sure there because otherwise I'm yeah. flying someplace else. I know we are trying to put together a, a dinner type thing that we can social distance for coming up. I think we are trying to go with it uh, right around where the Harvest Festival would be. We're obviously not doing our big tent on top of our hill. We're not doing any of that stuff. But, uh, you know, we, we did a crab feed a uh, couple weeks ago that was very successful. Again, our patio is big, so we can keep everybody outdoors and social distance and pull off that. And so we're trying to do something like that. Again, go to www.opolo.com. That's O-P-O-L-O. And uh, it, it, there should be something on the website about it. Right on. Yeah, thank you very much. So, all right, you guys, we're going to wrap this one up. Uh, I will tell you, though, when we get to open up again and do everything like we like to do, the uh, the harvest party over at Opolo is epic. It's the one of the coolest things ever. Uh, and then the shows out at uh, Vina Robles, you know, shoot, I was uh, all set and fired up to see uh, the tribute uh, by Primus uh, doing the whole ah. the Kings show uh, this year. Ah. And then Neil dies. It's like, you know, anyway. So, um, yeah, that was, that's going to be uh, awesome to, to see the rescheduled show. And then Broken. They're coming Earth. back. Everything's just re rescheduled yeah, for 2021 for the most part. Right on. And then uh, Broken Earth, their new facility there. We, we got to actually break it in a little bit with an event that we did there. And this place is, is amazing. You guys got that huge pizza oven. And when everything can kind of come back and everybody can fill that space, it's a pretty epic space over there. So you'll hopefully be able to check that out someday. Uh, thank you guys uh, so much for joining me. Carrie from San Diego, Lister here locally, and Justin Tooley uh, out there uh, in Chicago uh, for now. Uh, thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. Cheers. Cheers. Ching. I just finished my wine. Sorry, you got to sip it anyway. Uh, hey, next show, next week, it's all about Petite Syrah. We got some uh, producers uh, that are going to be in on that. And we're going to be talking about Petite. And then the show after that, I've got a couple of wine judges. So people from across the, the country, uh, in the, the middle, the East Coast, the West Coast, uh, these, these uh, professional tasters, uh, bloggers, sommeliers, uh, that are going to be uh, talking about wine judging and, and what goes into that. So join me again okay. at the Paso Wine Hangout. Go to PasoWine.com to uh, check out all of the future shows and see some of the past shows. So right on. Thanks, guys. Thank you. See ya.